Welcome, everyone. We'd like to thank you for participating in today's Hubbub webinar, Recipe for Success, Effective Planning for Giving Days, led by our presenter, Dan Frezza, from the College of William & Mary. In this webinar, we will focus on how you and your team can select goals that best suit your mission and effectively plan a day of giving. Dan will demonstrate how any program, whether big or small, and with limited or overflowing resources, can maximize success. Dan will speak on the topic for 45 minutes, and we have allotted 15 minutes at the end for your questions, which we hope to have lots of. Questions can be sent via the questions tab on your webinar dashboard. All questions are good questions, so please send them through during the webinar. To start things off, we're going to take a quick poll of the group, which you should see appear on your screens now. To help Dan understand the pulse of those participating today, please tell us if your institution has previously run a giving day. While you're filling out the poll, I will introduce our speaker. Dan Frezza is the Associate Vice President for Lifetime Philanthropic Engagement and Annual Giving at the College of William & Mary, where he oversees the strategic leadership and execution of a comprehensive annual giving approach. Under his leadership, Dan has successfully positioned annual giving and participation as key elements of a comprehensive $1 billion campaign. During his five-year tenure, William & Mary has grown from a participation rate of 23% in 2012 to a projected 31% by June 2017. Part of that success has come from the implementation of William & Mary's Day of Giving, One Tribe, One Day. Now in its fifth year, the annual day has increased in size from over 1,900 donors in year one to over 12,600 in March 2017. Now that I've introduced Dan, we'll just go back and have a quick look at our poll, and it looks like we have 57% of institutions who have said that they have run a day of giving, and 43% who have said that they have yet to run a day of giving, so half and half. Um, and hopefully that should give Dan a good scope for what's happening with those institutions who are participating today. And with that, I will turn it over to Dan. Excellent. Thank you, Kat. And welcome, everybody, to uh, hopefully what will be an exciting conversation around Days of Giving. I've done a similar presentation in the past to uh, a larger and in live setting. And so typically, I would try to get the group excited. And, and hopefully, my energy is a little bit infectious um, for folks that know me in the industry. I am very passionate about the work we do in annual giving, but I am even uh, more so passionate about these types of campaigns. Um, for me, a day of giving is an opportunity for you to showcase not just to your, your unit and your institution the work that you do in annual giving, but to the entire fabric of the community, where you can really put out um, the type of work you do in a very public setting that also does a great job of impacting or educating um, the importance of giving and the impact of, of generous support. So today, the first thing I want to make sure we cover before we go over the overview is to just get one thing that we all agree on, which are, or which is that giving days come in all shapes and sizes, whether you're focusing on a dollar goal or a donor goal, or you're supported by a large budget or a small budget, or you're uh, leading a small school or a large school. At the end of the day, there are multiple ways to accomplish the same campaign. We're going to spend our time focusing on the core principles that will make any of those uh, endeavors successful regardless of the factors in play, whether you're small, large, whether you have great amounts of wealth or you're a small state or uh, struggling private school, um, or whether you have a large or an audacious dollar goal or donor goal. We're going to talk about a little bit about what William & Mary does, and I will say just for full disclosure, um, this is not because I believe what we do at the College of William & Mary um, as being the industry best or the only way to be successful, but it's certainly been a structure that's worked well for me. Um, I will also showcase some other schools that are doing some similar type work, but in a little bit of a different avenue. And so to get to the overview, we're going to obviously focus today on understanding the right way to get started. So again, this presentation is mostly on your proper planning leading up to execution. We're going to talk about the importance of a committee structure, the importance of managing the all in, in um, important uh, buy-in, understanding your needs and goals, I absolutely will be spending time talking about resources, both budget, financial, as well as human capital. The importance of execution, um, and not just those that are, are working on the event, but the importance of actually implementing the day. Uh, we're going to look at illustrating the impact, something we do very much in annual giving that I think many of us will say uh, equates to a lot of success. But illustrating the impact, not just of the day and the dollars behind it, 
but the types of engagement and the type of um, tradition that it creates on your campus or in your organization. We're going to focus on email and volunteer engagement management and as I mentioned we'll be providing some results throughout the day on uh, what William & Mary has done over the last five years. So how many of you, I would ask if we were in person, hopefully we're all thinking about it, have had a vice president or a trustee decree that we must have a giving day? So I say we must have a day of giving, said the trustee or vice, pre or vice president. And what I've outlined here is the recipe for failure. And so for full disclosure, I will say that this is the recipe of William & Mary's first day of giving. So one part last minute, two parts lack of buy-in, one tablespoon of a budget, a smaller teaspoon of vision and goals, stir in new technology and whip until fluffy, use two chefs and only four sous chefs, and then bake and charbroil the thing until it's dead. This is certainly something that Chef Ramsay would scream about in his kitchen and certainly something that we would not want to eat. Um, so in my eyes, this captures the most uh, failed recipe for success if you're planning a day of giving. If you're thinking about it last minute, if you don't have enough buy-in, if you don't have an adequate budget or that you're scaling to your budget, if you don't have vision and goals, and if you're trying to do too much in too short a time and you don't have a dedicated leader, you're going to end up putting something in the oven on charbroil. So we learned our lesson, stupidity doing the same thing and expecting different results. And so this will sort of outline uh, the next uh, 40 or so minutes of our conversation um, in terms of what I think is the best recipe. And certainly I would say most of this is probably at the core of many strong programs around the country and around the globe that are doing these types of campaigns. We're going to talk about committee structure, um, the idea that we'll do away with you know, the small group mentality, but getting a large group to really play an active role, including one chef and not two chefs in the kitchen. Uh, getting the all-important buy-in, both internally and externally, making sure that you have partners across campus and across your institution's division and department that are at at the table in conversation during the planning period. Another part of the recipe is discuss goals and define what they mean. So whether you have a dollar goal or a donor goal, we'll focus on that, but also whether or not you're looking at things that are intangible as goals or non-monetary goals such as engagement. And then also thinking about how you put in industry best practice such as looking at frequency strategies or gift migration strategies um, to explain or to at least define what your goal means and what you want to get from it. And then also examine the and account for resources, both from technology, volunteers, and again, budget. So if you're doing these things as your recipe, I think you're setting yourself up for success. And as I have a nice um, French chef, very nice, I think it's the right way to go. Certainly, again, it's not the only way, but I do believe it's at the core. So let's first talk about the committee structure. Regardless of anything else, I think this if, if anybody takes anything away from this conversation today, it's do this via committee, not alone. Um, we learned our first year, again, two chefs and four other people locked in a small room trying to do too much with not enough time and not enough support was a recipe for failure. So out of this, if you get nothing else, committee structure is the number one thing I would recommend. First and foremost is make it scalable. Um, think about the size of your team and the type of culture that exists at your campus. If I were to think about the first day of giving that really caught my attention, um, it's actually not Columbia, which is one of one of the schools that is most you know usually associated with one of the forefathers or founding starters of these types of campaigns. But it's actually a small school in South Carolina called Wofford. Um, Wofford is a small private liberal arts. It's outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And their day of giving, and this was probably six, seven years ago, was one that caught my attention because they played very much to the scale that they had, both in budget, both in staff, and both in culture, uh, even down to their very brand. Um, Wofford is situated, again, outside of Charlotte. Charlotte is the home of the Charlotte Motor Speedway and the home of the NASCAR Hall of Fame for folks that are into racing. But they actually branded their day the Wofford 500. They played on their geographic you know, makeup. They played on the fact that their... Uh, their institution's populations would under, uh, understand what that means. And their day was very much a grassroots-led day. You could tell it was very small budget supported, but you could also tell that it was infectious and extremely um, collaborative across the university where they had professors and faculty and the president of the institution and student callers all part of the day very visible. So you want to make sure you have a committee that is first built around that scale. We'll, we'll discuss some of that as an example. Representation is critical. Making sure that, again, you have campus-wide um, volunteers that are advocating and are at the table and able to advocate. 
and then thinking about the structure, making sure you're building the committee structure based on the goals that you are going to identify. And we're going to talk a little bit about goals today. But most importantly, for instance, if part of your goal is to have great advocacy across your campus, making sure, again, that the structure of the committee is built to support it. If you know you want to increase social media or you want to increase alumni engagement, you know, make sure that you've got somebody from University Marketing Communications or the Alumni Association at your table that's a part of the committee. Timeline and frequency of the committee is critical. How often do you meet and when? In my eyes, it's often and long term. Um, you know, meeting just once a month for two months prior to the day means that you have two meetings in 60 days to plan an event. If you're meeting four times a month in eight weeks, eight meetings are nice, but do you have enough time to still put proper planning into it? So for my idea, it's often and long term. At William & Mary, we actually start meeting 10 months out, and we meet every other week for 10 months. Meeting up to the final 90 days, we start meeting every week. Therefore, we have plenty of opportunity to meet. And then the last part of the committee structure is work by committee, which is the use of subcommittees. And the idea behind this is, is once you get the proper representation, the whoever you want in that room as advocates, making sure that they're now leading subcommittees and, and that the real work is being conducted in those committees. And what I mean by that is, if you've got 12 people on your committee, um, that's 12 people that over the course of months are working or killing themselves, but if they each are leading subcommittees, now you're, ad, now you're, you're asking 30 to 40 colleagues to be involved. So if you have a subcommittee that's focusing on one core area, it's a small group of dedicated individuals that are focusing on a specific goal, but also you're getting buy-in along the way because you're now involving more than just 12 people in your infrastructure. So what may make most sense is to look at the William & Mary structure to, to sort of identify or capture what I just rambled through. At William & Mary, we had the following committees. Um, so we ended up with eight committees as a part of ours, or eight, mem eight subcommittees as a part of our committee. There's one subcommittee that is based on communication, solicitation, and stewardship, meaning that there are three people as a part of our overall One Tribe, One Day committee that are leading the uh, responsibility to develop the communication plan, the solicitation plan, and the follow-up stewardship. Those three individuals led a subcommittee on the same topic and involved 12 or so of their colleagues to help really think through strategy. We had another subcommittee that focused on campus engagement. These folks were entirely focused on what happens during our day of giving on campus, from our large marquee campus event down to what departments are doing in terms of local uh, events on campus. We also separated that from regional engagement. We had a group of colleagues that led a regional engagement subcommittee where they spent months talking about how many of events we would have, what the type of events um, would look like, uh, and how we would leverage them. Uh, at William & Mary, we average about 50 events across the globe on our day of giving. And we'll talk a little bit about the importance of leveraging those. But that's the ability for now a small group to really focus on what our engagement plan is outside of Williamsburg. Uh, we have a group that's focused on school and unit involvement. One of the things we learned from our first day of giving was, again, it's a small group and we didn't have buy-in across campus. So we wanted colleagues that sat around the table to help us think through how do we get the School of Business, the law school, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science involved in our day of giving. And these two colleagues led a subcommittee that went around for months talking to colleagues in the different school and units across campus to get their buy-in, but also to help them design a plan of how they'd be involved in the day. We had a volunteer engagement committee that focused on how we leverage volunteers. We had an analytics and gift accounting committee that helped focus and make sure that the greatest of details were covered in how we're reporting out the day as in live time data, but also how we're able to you know, process over 12,000 um, donors in a single day. We had another group that was focused on our um, challenge gifts, which we'll talk about, which is making sure that we're not asking people for six figure or five figure, even four figure challenge donations without a great explanation or with enough time to have them fully think through it. This was a part of the committee that really said, these are our major gift prospects. We involved major gift officers and we put together a plan 10 months out to make sure we were engaging the right donors. And then the last one I would say is if you have, if you're actively in a campaign, we actually had a committee of one, which was an individual that um, is our campaign liaison to make sure that everything we were planning was always in the same voice and in the same brand as the campaign overall that the institution is launching. So this was our makeup of our committee structure. And I would say that when we get to question and answer, I'm happy to answer questions about whether I think these are the right ones or whether I would do things differently and also how we've evolved. But I do believe it's a good snapshot in how you can plan a committee, which is noticing the William & Mary approach was looking at a strong solicitation communication day that relied heavily on engagement 
that needed school and unit involvement that was backed by volunteers and we had a strong back end shop to support the day from both gift accounting and challenge gifts and we built a committee around it. So getting them to buy in is the next major step. We have your committee in place and now you have to get folks to, to buy in and this is both internally and externally. The folks that are on your committee within your departments but also across campus and beyond. I always love to say advocates are better than adversaries. And the first year, we certainly had more adversaries than advocates. We were sitting in a room with, again, five or so people, and nobody knew how to help because nobody knew what we were doing. And so by having advocates, they're A, a part of what you're doing, and B, they're able to help out whenever you need them. So the number one piece was essentially one chef, one spokesperson. This is the individual that will manage the process. And so what I would recommend is whoever you select, whether it's yourself or somebody you select for you, make sure they clear their schedule and they're ready to shake a lot of hands. This was a role that I played uh, for our day of giving. This is the person that makes sure the process is moving along in the right direction, that folks are attending meetings, that you're achieving uh, milestones that you set up, but also that you're out in the community of campus making sure that folks are hearing what you're doing and that you're consistently advocating for the work that's being done. Credibility begins with conversation. Have a plan um, for each advocate. And so what I mean by this is if you know you want to engage student affairs, athletics, or other school and units on campus, have a plan for them. Allow them to see the potential impact they would have in a day of giving. Because if they are, if you are credible in what you're um, bringing to them and you're consistently talking with them about opportunities that exist for them to leverage the day, you now have an opportunity to gain additional advocates as well as their partnership in the day. Conversations don't occur in a vacuum. We learned this greatly from our first day of giving. Um, an active committee working over time matters and communicating their actions are equally as critical, meaning essentially that if they're active and they're meeting on a regular basis, you're going to see productivity and you're going to see great creativity come out in dialogue and hopefully executed through implementation. Communicating their actions is how you're keeping morale up, making sure that folks are not just aware of the work we're doing, but also they're proud of the work we're doing. So again, even if you have a great committee, if all you're doing is meeting once every other week or once a month or however often your frequency decide, you decide, and you're not communicating that outside of that committee, I can promise you that you'll have 12 people sitting in a room sweating during your day of giving when you need to actually have more support behind you. So consistently communicate the work that's being done so that you're not also rushed in the final moment of your day of giving, trying to present to the world what you're asking them to do in a short period of time. Again, the William & Mary approach, I was the chief advocate for the day. I spent a lot of time in board meetings, in staff meetings, and talking to other blind mice along the way. Essentially, I was the used car salesman of our day of giving. Anybody that would listen would hear about One Tribe One Day, the exciting things that we were doing, and the opportunities that exist for them to be a part of it. Um, that was my role, and I made that very clear to the committee. They knew that I would run the meetings. I would go around in a round-robin round fashion and ask for updates, but I would stay out of the way of planning. Um, at the end of the day, the more minds you have in the room with great creative uh, approaches, the better product you're going to have. My role was to make sure that they had what they needed to be successful and that everybody knew what we were doing. We outlined a plan for key partners and stakeholders. So that subcommittee I mentioned about school and unit involvement especially, those were folks that consistently met with the deans and the department heads and different academic units across campus months in advance to say, here's an opportunity for um, the School of Education and we'd love for you to be a part of it. Our day of giving very much is focused on we're going to manage a university, a pan-university um, campaign that anybody can leverage to their best interest meaning that we'll send all the emails, we'll manage all the communications, but we want you to take what we're doing and leveraging it to your area. So the School of Education may decide we're going to do something in our own building that day to get our constituents aware of the day and to be engaged and involved that's going to benefit the School of Education. These are opportunities where you have these plans in place and stakeholders say, I now see success in this for me and I'm willing to be involved. It's also bigger than just, for instance, a school and unit. Um, he, uh, I call them Kevin Bacons on campus, folks that are great network, network influencers are individuals that you certainly want to tap into months in advance. So that great student affairs advisor who's been on campus for 30 years that I take out to lunch every few, every so often to say, here's how the day is being planned and this is what we're looking to accomplish. By the way, here's 300 uh, former students of yours that are active on social media. Would you be willing during the day to reach out to each one of them and ask them for their support? These are ways that you start to see great plans come into place. 
We showcased the work that the committees were doing on a regular basis through staff meetings and division-wide meetings or any board opportunity I had. And again, we put the subcommittees to work. We got out of their way. Our, our overall committee would identify opportunity, but we let the subcommittees really think through the creativity of how to implement them. The next important part, once you have your committee together and your committee is actively moving on a plan, you also want to think through what your goals are and to make sure you can prove the value of those goals. And so the first and foremost that, that you most likely will think through are, are we looking at dollars or donors? And what I will say is that both are present. It's the question of which one will lead. If you are a dollar-oriented day, you will need a, a tremendous number of donors to be successful. If you are a donor-driven day, you will ultimately yield a large sum of dollars. And you'll see that in some of the examples we share. But you do want to think through which goal is best for you. You also want to keep in mind what your duration is. Um, campaigns I typically see run anywhere from 12 to 24 hours, 27 hours, all the way up to 52 hours, which Wake Forest did a couple of years ago. But they folded it into their brand. Theirs was around a, a deck of cards and 52 card pickup. And so it made sense to do it for 52 hours. My personal opinion is 24 hours or less. Uh, folks are driven by a deadline, um, and we see that in our numbers, uh, you know, very much so. But again, if you're looking at a major dollar goal, you may need 52 hours to, to think through it. So when you're examining your goal, make sure how they uh, work for you, but also how they relate to your institutional goals. If you're in a, a capital campaign where dollars are king, you probably are going to have a dollar-driven day. Um, at William & Mary, we are a little bit different. We're in a campaign with three goals, and the core of those three goals is to establish a culture of what we call engagement and philanthropy, meaning that over the course of this campaign, we want a culture that, that develops that is um, going to foster the William & Mary for the next 325 years. Um, one of those campaign goals, however, is an undergraduate alumni participation goal of reaching 40% by 2020. So therefore, when we looked at our goal, we knew we were going to be donor-driven, most likely, um, and that we wanted to focus on a 24-hour uh, you know, deadline to reach diverse populations. The importance of sub-goals, though, should some, be something that you don't you know, take for granted. We have an increasing need to raise unrestricted dollars on campus, and so a unique way that we've approached this is, on our day of giving, which is very donor-driven, we know that by asking anybody from all walks of life to make a gift, that the byproduct will be that undergraduate alumni will be a part of that population. So we're, you know, we're growing in that direction. But from an unrestricted dollar aspect, we leverage a lot of challenges. And because we're, buying, we're getting buy-in from school and units across campus, we also don't want to create the opportunity where there are the haves and have-nots, meaning that the School of Business with more wealth or the School of Education has larger challenge donors, therefore they can be more successful. We instead ask all challenge donors to give to the fund for and Mary, which selfishly and behind the scenes means it's addressing this other critical goal of ours, which is to raise unrestricted dollars. But also publicly, it means that we're not creating the haves and have-nots when we're asking for all school and units to be involved equally. And so when you're thinking about your goals, you've got to really think from the top down. Again, all the way to what your, your, your campus culture is telling you, what your, your institution's core goals are, dollars or donors, all the way down to the sub-goals that you're looking at. You can go even deeper, as I mentioned on the uh, first slide, where we talked about frequency and gift migration. If you're an institution where you're struggling with reactivation rates or retention rates, how are you engaging donors that have already made a gift that year to make a second gift that day? Um, for many of us that have been in the industry for a period of time, we know that there's a magic number that most of us have, which greatly increases the likelihood of retention or greatly increases the likelihood of gift migration, meaning the size of the average gift going in the right direction, meaning increasing. Uh, at William & Mary, we know that $100 is that magic number. If you reach $100, you are three times, or excuse me, two times more likely to renew your gift. So our day of giving, we also leverage second asks. We make sure that donors that are giving between $50 and $75 are being asked for a minimum of $25 to $50, so that if nothing else, we've hit another goal of ours, which means our retention rates will be better the next year. So when you look at your goals, think through top all the way down to the most micro, such as frequency and migration. It's something, again, that I think proves the reasoning for substantial time in your planning. Hunting and gathering. So the resources are a critical component of what we do. And so this is probably one of the questions I get the most from, you know, how you are able to provide, you know, a, a day of giving um, to the magnitude that we provide. And this is where it's going to begin to separate out schools from one another because, as I said, days of giving are not all equal 
and neither of us are as well. What I will say is it comes down to first your budget and, and how you allocate your budget. And so I have individual and collective here. Individual means the dollars that you specifically address or task to your day of giving. Collective means looking around to what other budgets currently exist and how you can tap into them. And so the difference between the two is at William & Mary, our budget doubled this past year. We put $20,000 as our budget for our day of giving. The year prior, it was $10,000. But we spend a tremendous more, you know, it, uh, we spend more than that on an annual day. But the way we go about it is looking at what other things are already planned. And so, for instance, if our alumni association is planning an event in City A, we go to the alumni association and say, we would like to have a One Tribe One Day event in City A. Would you be willing to host your event on One Tribe One Day? Now you're ending up with an event that's supporting your day, but you're not asking for the budget to be increased because the alumni association is also meeting its mission of having an event in that said city. You're not always able to do that, but I can promise you that every school has the ability to collectively pass the hat to some extent. Whether it's your marketing shop that has a budget allocated for specific mailings that you can tap into, or whether it's human capital that also have specific talents and trades that you can tap into rather than asking to outsource. So somebody who's in another division across campus that's great at web design, rather than paying an outsourced designer, see if you can tap into it. And again, it comes back to the idea of if you're having these conversations months in advance and regular and often, you're able to do some of those things. Staff structure is also important, whether you're an advancement model or a development model. For folks that um, don't know the difference, what I mean by an advancement model means that you have the alumni association and most likely a university marketing and communications team within your umbrella versus development where you're just fundraisers and those entities are separate. At the end of the day, they shouldn't make a difference because you can engage them. Um, if they're on your team, it means that you can go straight to the reporting line and ask for their support. If they're not on your team, it means you're meeting months in advance and, and asking for their support as a colleague. But the importance ultimately is the staff structure and your resources. That will impact your budget. If you're a small shop and you don't have videographers on campus or um, designers on campus or web uh, uh, designers on campus, you're probably going to have to allocate some of your budget to some outside work. Whereas, again, if you have the ability to do everything in-house, you have a much smaller budget, and that budget is typically dedicated to things that are, are more um, dollar-driven, such as events, you know, things that you can't do in-house, things like paying for events, renting space, uh, buying advertising on social media, things of that nature. Um, ultimately, as you're planning your budget, you have to take those into account. The one piece I will put in the staff structure that is important to note that is an investment in my eyes is talent management. And I do believe these types of campaigns and others like them are great opportunities to invest in your staff and, and should be taken seriously as you begin to put your committee together. And an example of that is um, both direct and indirect growth. So my director of direct marketing leads our communication solicitation subcommittee. They're putting into practice during the planning session the very work that they do to support annual giving on a daily basis, but they're getting great uh, experience in leading a portion of a major campaign. The indirect opportunities, however, is another gentleman on our staff that uh, does serve the analytical uh, part of the, of the subcommittees, but he also has a great creative mind. And so we've put him on the subcommittee for solicitation communication as well so that he can be a breath of fresh air and also sharpen his creative or his creative skills and learn a little bit at, a little bit about annual giving. At the end of the day, you're ending up with team members that can ultimately one day lead the overall effort and also are better as a professional in terms of their trade. And so it's something to consider as you're also thinking about getting folks from other parts of the campus to be involved in the day. Current atmosphere and culture of giving is also probably the last important piece about your resources. So again, you have your, your budget in mind, you know what you can afford. To the Wofford example, you know what you can accomplish. To the staff example, you have great staff um, opportunities for growth, but you still have to think about what the campus culture is telling you, what the success means. And this comes directly down to, in my eyes, return on, return on investment. If um, you need to go zero to 60 and you can only afford a Pinto, you probably need to think about going zero to 20. But if you need to go zero to 60 and you can afford you know, a Shelby Mustang or a faster sports car, you might as well look to invest if you think you can hit 60. And what I mean by that in terms of William & Mary is the very bottom bullet. We pulled a number that we looked at for our donor goal 
as we started our first One Tribe One Day, which was that 43% of our alumni had made a gift over a five-year period, which meant this is a great opportunity for a good return on investment, and it's worth investing in because we have a large number of donors that give, they just don't give every year. And if we can create a tradition through a day like this where they have the opportunity to give every year, our numbers may move in the right direction. And so we chose to invest in the sports car because we could, but also because we knew we could hit 60 miles per hour. We also were fortunate with our budgeting that we have in-house developed. So again, the William & Mary example, we are an advancement model with a lot of good in-house talent. So we were able to save a lot of our budget costs by not expending things outsourced but actually using that money for things that we would need to pay for, like events, like menus, food, um, and advertisements and things like that. So execution planning can only go so far. Um, I am a sucker for a good Venn diagram, which is what you have here on the right. And the reason why I love this diagram when we talk about days of giving and micro campaigns is that it's balanced no matter what way you look at it. And back to the idea that if, if you're dollar or don donor focused, they're both present, one's leading. The same can be said for all three of these. Dollar donors and engage, dollars participation and engagement is a part of any successful day of giving. And you need to rely on all three, and all three will be at the core of what you do. If you're looking to raise $14 million in a day, you're going to need a lot of donors, and you're going to have to make people feel warm and fuzzy about it for you to be successful. If you're wanting to get more awareness around your alumni engagement team, Ultimately, they're going to feel better about the process, more people are going to give, and you're going to see dollars from it. And so when you think about a day of giving, think about how these three things are at the core of what you're planning. And so when you look at, again, what we've done and what other schools have done in the past, you have a good mix-up of engagement and donor-driven tactics as well as dollar recognition so that you have all walks of life in your day of giving feeling warm and fuzzy about their experience, but ultimately building a tradition that, that the campus can rely on. Pre-event marketing is a big piece of execution. And so this is, again, these are two things that I think all of us uh, planning a day or have done a day can, can capitalize on. And some of it comes back to that collective budgeting again. If you have an alumni magazine and you're able to plan your day of giving with enough space after the, the, the most recent issue, you have free advertising or in some aspects maybe slightly expensive if you have to pay for advertising. Um, readership though to your entire alumni community that talks about your day of giving where you can market it in a very visible fashion. I don't, recognize, I don't recommend marketing months in advance. Um, there are a lot of schools that typically will um, stop asking for gifts weeks out and all you're doing is redistributing those gifts that would have come into your day of giving and you're also missing out on opportunities to increase the frequency of giving. I I conduct businesses, normal business as usual, the day up to our day of giving, and we don't start marketing until roughly about 30 days out. Thinking about how you market creative, creatively is also important. So teaser videos, um, if you're going to be using videos or you're going to be using social media, begin to tease the types of channels you want people utilizing during your day of giving as part of your pre-event marketing. An example of this is the first video we produced during our second One Tribe One Day was a great video of our president and our mascot. Um, that mark the day on the calendar, but what folks didn't realize is that there was a pretty big subliminal message there. The video was based on our president and our mascot learning how to take a selfie and how to tweet. And what that told our base was that not only was the day coming 30 days from now, but the central carrier of the day was social media. And that if our 75-year-old president could learn how to use Twitter and take a selfie, that most anybody else could. And so that when you were experiencing the day of giving that was heavily on our end driven through social media, it began to connect a little bit. This past year, we uh, sent a, we didn't do a video as a teaser, we did a photo. Um, our video series this year was around Hollywood movies. And one of the movies, our president, dressed up as a sheriff in an old spaghetti western. But we took that photo, a still from the video, and said, why is President Ridley dressed up as a cowboy? Tune in to March 28th to learn. And again, it got people wondering what the day is about, but also it played a little bit of a, of a um, teaser towards the video series. We live in a digital world, and that's something that we can't forget with Days of Giving. Um, I would say as much as the committee structure being a, a critical component to planning a successful day, if you actually plan a day without social media and it ends up being successful, I think you may be one of the first ones to accomplish that. Every Day of Giving, the commonality that I have seen is that social media is the driver. Whether you're spending money outsourcing a, a pre-built platform from a, a vendor or you're building one on your own, Everything is data and digital driven. 
social media is definitely an important piece of what we do. Um, and thinking about how you leverage volunteers such as social media influencers, how you consistently um, use a common message, and how you creatively reach smaller markets than you typically do through uh, your normal institution social media channels is an important piece. Videography is important because it's engaging. And websites for us is extremely critical because it serves as our central hub. So whether you again purchase a platform or you build your own, um, our website is our central hub for the work that we do on our day of giving. And so you can go to our website and look at our leaderboard. You can go to our website and look at our tag board back to social media. So you can look at all the channels and all of the conversations. And you can also go and um, tune in to watch the video series as they unveil themselves. But our website is our core. Without it, we would not have the success we would have. Engaged philanthropy is also critical. And this is where I would say that um, you know, having events, soliciting involvement is just as important. Um, having the ability to track success. Folks like a good challenge. They, re they respond well to challenge gifts on days of giving. All four of those are aspects of engaged philanthropy. And they all commingle with social media and digitally uh, marketing. For instance, events are important, but you're not going to reach 12,000 donors from 50 events. But we are going to do from 50 events is put a great digital footprint out to the rest of the university's um, community that William & Mary is alive and well, we're committed, and we're all involved from Japan to California. And that's a great visual that social media provides, but without events wouldn't be able to accomplish it. To show just a little bit of uh, illustrating of the impact, um, you have two things in front of you. One is our, uh, our heat map. Uh, this is, again, an example of engaged uh, philanthropy. We started doing this our second One Tribe One Day. This is a map that you can go to on our website. And the first year we did it, the, ask, the idea was to go from green to gold. We wanted to paint the entire country, and then we had the globe as well, in green to gold with what we call Tribe Pride. We've built on this every year, all the way up to this past year. Now green to gold and the yellow shaded uh, or gold shaded colors are the most active 10 states, which meant you may have the state with the most donors, but if your donors stopped supporting you by the end of the day, your state would go back to green. All the way down to actually implementing what we called pin drops, which means when you made your gift, we would use the area code where you made your gift from, and a little pin would show up on the map so that you could actually see yourself. You were engaged in the process of making a gift. The right side is our... Um, right after the day concluded, but it shows all of the, the various one-stop shops that you can look at during your day of giving online. Our ticker had stopped counting, but we communicated what our challenges were. We communicated the successes. We had the bar graph in the center, which shows the school and unit competition, where school and units are seeing, again, the impact that's in it for them. And then certainly have our video warehouse, where you can be involved in our videos. Social media is key. Again, engaged philanthropy is not transactional. Um, if you want to make sure you avoid transactional philanthropy, put some engagement in it. Uh, you've got some examples here of, of social media posts and tweets throughout the day that we captured off our tag board. On the left is our student's uh, event where they actually had a student petting zoo, which made a lot of our alums jealous that lived afar from campus. Uh, one of my favorite tweets of the day, in line for coffee at Georgetown, and the two girls in front of me are both hashtag tribe alums talking about hashtag one tribe one day, hashtag taking over, hashtag fam. It's an example, again, that this really was about an institutional love fest. People began to show their tribe pride. And then the bottom right photo I would point out is be careful who you invent, invite to events because you'll never know who shows up. Um, in that photo towards the third from the right is actually Glenn Close, one of our proud alumnas um, of the institution and a very um, successful actress, uh, both Broadway and Hollywood. I showed up at one of our alumni events because she saw how much excitement was being conducted through our day of giving and social media provided the opportunity to be a part of that and also to find out where to meet. Email strategy is certainly one that I know will come up in our questions and answers, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. What I will say is it's dependent on your goal and technology. If you're able to do real-time reporting, you have the ability to do a little bit more with your emails. If you're focusing on dollars and donors, you may decide to have a different strategy, whether you're sending more or less or whether you're sending them from Jane Doe or the president. What I will say is that I would, I would not expect a day of giving to have anything less than three emails um, sent out. We send out between seven and nine uh, as the institution, not counting any small rogue school or unit that decides to send their own out. Again, we try to present it as be active through grassroots efforts, 
be active through social media, let us take on the emails, but you still end up with that professor out there that sends their own email to somebody. But we also own the fact that it's crazy and that we have a lot of um, you know edgy volume when it comes to the amount of uh, solicitations we send out. But giving days should be edgy. And I would say don't be too fearful of opt-out rates. We have not seen uh, horrible opt-out rates, and a lot of the institutions I've looked at that have had strong days of giving also have not had strong opt-out rates. And if you do, this is again what we do and what I've seen as a common practice, treat removal requests differently. When you opt out of our email structure on our day of giving, we put you back in the next day. We take that as you're communicating enough is enough today, but today is not your normal day. You're normally not going to get seven or nine emails in a single 24-hour period. So tomorrow is a new day. But again, those are questions that you'll want to make sure you ask. And again, strategy should be commingled with your school and unit um, planning. Volunteers are an important part of the day as well. And so when we talk about volunteer engagement, um, what I would like to spend a little time on is, is not necessarily your volunteers that are helping you plan the day, but now your volunteers that are helping you execute the day. And so this is an example of something that we did, but also shows that you need to be flexible throughout the day as, as it unfolds as well. We have uh, class ambassadors, which are essentially class agents um, that represent their classes and reach out to classmates uh, throughout the year asking for gifts. And on one tribe one day, we harness all of their energy and all of their excitement, and they, sent, they certainly are a group that helped make us very successful. Uh, we were able to do real-time identification of donors. So again, back to email strategy, we had that ability, so we were able to send out more emails, which also meant we could communicate to our volunteers more regularly how their classes were uh, progressing. At 10.45 that evening, we were already past our goal and we were trying to find ways to sustain or the momentum so that folks were excited and that we can continually have a, a larger and more successful day. This is an example of even a shop like William & Mary that has all the bells and whistles that, you know, sometimes less, uh, less flair works. And so in the top right corner is a very static image that a group of colleagues created that uh, they reached out to volunteers. They looked for the top 10 classes with the most donors that day sent out an email to volunteers, and then sent an email out to the entire campus in those classes to say, you are in the top 10, and we want to see which class can have the most donors on one tribe one day, and sent a very simple email out that had a great response. And I won't read through all of the responses on the bottom, but our volunteers really appreciated this and also appreciated it being low tech, things like, yay, thanks for all the updates. We're keeping them updated. We're trending on Twitter. They knew that we were using social media, and my favorite and last one, I think you all have been drinking well cheers from one of our volunteers across the pond. A book of recipes uh, has multiple meals and others are just as satisfying. And so when we get to the questions in a few moments, you know, these are just some things to sort of tee up. Um, there are really three types of days of giving that I would say I've seen regularly. Ones that focus on dollars, one that focus on donors, and ones that focus sort of the hybrid on gifts. And so the three that I would pick out as schools that are doing it very well are William and Mary, Notre Dame, and Columbia. And Notre Dame is the first one you see here. They are very gift driven. But if you recall what I said early on, take a look at the amount of dollars that they raised off their number of gifts. Notre Dame looks at their day of giving to raise gifts, but also has the commonality of being very visible. They manage a day long video um, conversation where they're bringing in alumni and members of the community to be interviewed about why they feel um, Notre Dame is so important and the impact the day is having on it and why others should be involved. So again, very visible, all digitally, um, um, all through digital media, but they also are looking at a very different way by counting gifts. They're asking people to make votes for areas of campus they want to see supported through individual gifts. And so the 25,000 gifts received may be less donors, but they're looking at the number of gifts and the number of areas that they can make an impact on. Ultimately, it raised a larger number of dollars. Columbia, on the other hand, is a very dollar-driven day. And they raised $14.5 million, but look at the number of gifts that it brought in. And so now their process is very different because they're leveraging challenged donors and they're working with major gift officers to identify ways to ask major donors to make a larger and stretched gift on that day. Um, but again, very visible, and, and Columbia had a great social media presence that also used, utilized challenges throughout the day. Notre Dame's example here uh, looks at, again, the crowdfunding type atmosphere where they're looking at areas of campus they wanted to see people supported, so the student experience, financial aid, and they had challenges dedicated to each one of those. And again, they're looking for the number of hearts, the number of votes 
that are in air that are in support of each of these areas and you voted by making a gift I believe a minimum of ten dollars um, but they were able to be ultimately successful with over 25,000 gifts. William & Mary, we were a donor-driven day. Um, as I mentioned, ours does not track gifts. If we looked at our 12,658 donors, we actually had close to 17,000 gifts that day from a community that is roughly um, 100,000 in size. Uh, but ultimately, you can see on the right side of ours infographic that we were supporting the growth of new donors, um, all alumni. We engaged students, faculty, staff, true parents, so not alumni parents. These are actually true parents. Um, and we did so through more simplistic challenges rather than a crowdfunding uh, you know, method. Ours was just counting the total number of donors. So we had you know, four simple challenges um, that, that supported school and unit, and then we had milestone challenges along the way. And then just a brief history of our One Tribe One Day, as, as Kat mentioned earlier on, we started with 1,906 donors. Our goal that year was 1,693, and this past year we've grown to 12,658. And what I would say is it's 100% dedicated to our ability to properly plan and meet months in advance. And I would say bon appetit, and we can open it up for questions. I know that folks have been adding along the way. Yep, uh, we have a couple questions, um, and please do keep your questions coming, um, and Dan is very keen to answer them, and we'll try and get to as many of them as we can. So we have a first one here, um, which is about the communication, solicitation, and stewardship subcommittee that you have at William & Mary, and um, asking if you could expand on how much these colleagues' time is spent working on the day of giving during different stages of planning. So how much of their time is uh, spent on the day of giving 10 months before, six months before, six weeks before. Yep. So I would say I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. One, as being the, the central driver of the day and building partnerships, I certainly am spending time with uh, the folks that represent these colleagues to make sure that they, A, are okay with their staff member lending some time and that, B, we're managing expectations so that I can say how often they'll be meeting. To answer the other part of it, we, again, we start meeting 10 months out. Um, which is typically around August. Um, we meet every other week as a committee. So for the folks that are leading the subcommittees, they meet a little bit more than the folks that are on the subcommittees. I do ask that the subcommittees are created by November of each year. So that means between August and September, we spend roughly four meetings as a committee overall, sketching out what it is we want to accomplish so that they can now construct their subcommittees to actually get the work. Their subcommittees should be meeting in between every meeting. So they, beginning in November, meet every other week. Uh, and then when we get to, again, that 90-day out period, they're meeting once a week. So it is a, a large amount of time. But the point is, if we're meeting much earlier, um, we should be able to actually conduct business within that hour-long session um, rather than um, you know, trying to rush two weeks of work in in one week before you get there. Now, the month leading up to the day, it's all hands on deck. And I would say, again, part of my role as being the, the chief advocate is all the way up to our vice president and president, it's an all hands on deck mentality, which means folks should now, this is on the calendar. If you're trying to do too much in the month of March, I'm constantly in your ear saying, don't forget one tribe one day is coming up. Your team needs to be creating web work for us. Your team needs to be soliciting um, or actually writing scripts for, uh, for volunteer callers. So it all comes down to planning in that sense. Right. Um, so the next question is um, around the uh, opting out of emails for that particular day. And is the removal request of um, your day of giving feature on your email service offered by the email service, or is the email addresses need to be opted back in manually after the fact? So we use a Salesforce platform, um, which allows us to, our, our provider actually collects the opt-outs and we code them as do not email um, on the back end, and at the front end, the service provider has a timestamp of when they are opting out for. And so we're able to select that for a 24-hour period. So the better way to actually explain it is we take a snapshot the day before and then replicate that logic the day after. So if you were opted out prior to One Tribe One Day, you don't get anything on One Tribe One Day. We're not, we're not breaking that breach of contract. But if you opt out on the day, we treat the day after as the day before, if that makes sense. It's different for, for different schools. I know some do have to go back in and manually add them back in. Um, I would recommend it. Um, folks that have said opting out on our day of giving that didn't give on one tribe one day do still end up giving by the end of the fiscal year. Great. 
Okay, another one here. Um, do you engage faculty and staff in any specific way for One Tribe One Day? So that, that is a, um, it's a great question, and I would say we are not a leader in that initiative, mainly because we are a small liberal arts school where our academics think a little bit, they should be a little bit more involved than they, they want to be. I think they want to be, but when they see how much work goes into it, they don't, they don't deliver. Um, this past year was the first time we actually had One Tribe One Day solicitation sent out um, on behalf of faculty from faculty. Typically what we've done is if you are a member of the faculty, staff or faculty that have a giving history, you show up in the solicitation stream throughout the day because you have a giving history. What we've always done is that the president or the provost sends a note out that morning that says today is one tribe one day, please feel free to make a gift if you're so moved, but we don't send them anything else. This year I worked with, and most schools have something similar, we have various assemblies. We have the faculty assembly, the staff assembly, the professional faculty assembly, and then an operational assembly. I went to all four of those chairs months in advance. Um, I felt like I was in the United Nations where I was breaking pe or breaking, brokering peace. We were over many meals, but got all four of them to agree to co-sign an email that went out the day before One Tribe One Day to acknowledge that faculty staff should be supportive of it. And also one went out at 9 a.m. that morning, signed on behalf of the four chairs of the four assemblies, asking for their support. And we ended up with a, about a 20% increase in faculty staff giving back this year. Wow, that's really great. Uh, one more here, and please do keep your questions coming if you have any more. Um, so can you tell us more about who your volunteer groups are, and does this include students? If so, what are their roles? Okay, so we, our subcommittee for volunteers um, focuses on a few. The largest chunk are our class ambassadors. We have about 900 and change class ambassadors um, that focus, again, just on their classes. But also within that subcommittee, um, the woman that led that focused on that group, but she also focused on all boards. And so she mapped out months in advance um, where all the boards were meeting and when and made sure that she or I or somebody else in the senior staff were able to get in front of those boards close enough to one tribe one day where it wasn't too far away, but not too close where there wasn't enough time to act. To, um, act. So January, February is when we did most of this to engage boards, to ask them to take on lists, to sponsor events, to underwrite events, to call on their own colleagues. Um, we also work with school and units uh, to look for volunteers they had that wanted to be leveraged. So for instance, our law school Im implemented a firm challenge where they went to uh, about a dozen volunteers in different law firms and instituted a challenge amongst law firms that day. All of that was housed within this person. Now, they didn't design every bit of it, but they were the person that was, bring, that was bringing resources to the table and supporting it. We have student volunteers, but they were not a part of that conversation. This was more for alumni or professional volunteers. Our student volunteers were brought into that campus um, event subcommittee because they were responsible for pulling off the campus event. We wanted our campus event to be very student-driven, very student-supported. and. It is like you could see from having a petting zoo on campus. It's you got to be careful what you ask for, but it's become a tradition where students look forward to it. This past year, we didn't have a petting zoo. That was the year before, but we had a giant shark um, that was like a mechanical bull on campus, where students lined up to ride a mechanical shark. We have a saying here at William and Mary called "Hark upon the gale." They put flyers up all over campus that said "Shark upon the gale," um, but it was very um, student-driven and student-supported. That's how we use our student volunteers. Great. Um, kind of linking to that, um, what were the specific events that you had on campus during the day? So the, the main one was our campus carnival, and that was in the afternoon from 4.30 to 7.30. And that, the idea there is for students to come to campus um, and, and visit um, faculty and staff as well as bringing their small children. There were inflatable games for toddlers, all the way up to, again, the mechanical shark. Uh, we had ice cream stands, food stands, live music. It really became sort of a spring carnival, um, and we've been building this up each and every year. That was the marquee event. But then there were small events throughout campus. Our, um, as a part of our school and unit competition, um, the schools really got behind uh, how they could leverage the day. And so the law school had a three-on-three -on -three basketball tournament uh, inside their lobby. The School of Business had a small MBA gathering on campus. So at the macro level, it was a large inclusive campus event. At the micro level, we supported the school and units to have their own smaller events. We just made sure we didn't compete with one another. So all the smaller events certainly were happening before 4.30 or after 7.30. Great. 
Um, and then one last question here about videos and were they produced in-house or were they an additional resource that you had to pay for outside? So ours were produced in-house. What I would recommend is um, if you go to YouTube and, and, and search for William & Mary's channel, you can actually see our, our series of videos. The way we leveraged ours um, is that each video installment launches a new challenge. And so our overall challenges for the day are milestone driven. So the first 1,000 donors equals $50,000. The next 2,000 donors equals $100,000. Um, but a video is what accompanies um, launching the new challenge. They're all in-house produced. We are very blessed and very fortunate to have very good videographers in university advancement. Um, I would say if we did not have them in existence, I would probably look to allocate resources to produce videos because I do believe they work. I believe they're engaging. Notre Dame has a full um, newscast that comes to campus and does a live feed for the entire day that actually does interviews for alumni and friends across campus. Um, that is a great way to be engaged when you're afar. And so I would say videos are important. But again, if you go to our YouTube, you'll see our videos over the course of One Tribe One Day. They're all in-house design. But there are also vendors out there that can give you the full package. They'll produce your entire day of giving, including videos, or there are a la carte you know, options where you just go to your local videographer and they produce something for you. Um, it looks like we've just had a couple more come in. Um, so looking at your regional events, um, what kind of things did those look like if people are looking for ideas of what they could tell their regional alumni to think about doing? So our, you know, I, I always feel guilty when I say we have more than 50 events because they're just most of the events are very small. Um, we have, if we were to go from the top down, um, a few what we call all-call events, which are large alumni engagement driven events in major markets where you end up with between 70 to 250 alums that register and show up. We typically ask for those to be underwritten by donors. Um, so again, back to the budgeting, when you think about collective, it's not just about what you can um, borrow, but also where you can motivate people to underwrite. And so all of those all-call events are actually sponsored or underwritten by donors. Those are the large ones. As you get to um, smaller markets, they're smaller. Some of them are just a cup of coffee with five friends that say, you know what, any alum that's in the Richmond area that wants to come and have coffee with us, we're going to be at, you know, serious coffee at 9 a.m. And people show up and they take a picture and put it on, you know, Twitter or Facebook. What I will say strategically are international events. We have about five of them, and we do try to leverage them to the max. So the first event we've had the last two years has been in Japan. And we've created the slogan that says, from, uh, from Tokyo to San Francisco via Williamsburg. The idea is that we want our folks on the East Coast waking up and seeing that Japan already kicked off our day of giving, and that Zurich and London also have had celebratory days of uh, events during day of giving. So that when folks in New York and Miami wake up, they see that the campus is already a buzz and that the community is already a buzz. And our last event is in San Francisco, California. So hence, Tokyo to San Francisco via Williamsburg. And again, those events, once you get beyond the all-call, some of them are networking events. Some of them are alumni events where it's a group of women from a league or group that are getting together. Um, we really, from a planning side, we have what we call salon events and all-call events. The all-call events are the ones that the staff plan. The salon events are ones where essentially it's an event in a box and if somebody raises their hand and says, we want to do something on one tribe one day, send us a box and we'll send you the plan. And if we approve of the plan, we put it on the docket as a marketing event. Great. And then I, there is one last one. I think this is really important for those who have yet to do a giving day. Um, and that's when you started to look at your goal um, and setting what your goal would be, where did you start to help you understand what that would be and focusing on dollars and donors and what amount that might be? Yep. So again, our, our, do our donor goal was a no-brainer because we have a very audacious public participation goal, which hinges on donor growth. Um, but aside from that, our first goal in the first year was 1693, um, 1693 donors. That's the year of William and Mary's founding, 1693. And so it sounds like we probably put a lot of thought into it, but we wanted a safe goal that we knew we could meet that drew a line in the sand, but the folks could rally around. So we went with 1693. The next year, we went to doubling what we finished the year before. What we've learned is that... Um, we outperformed the first three years, but there is a plateau coming. And so after 
we went with a goal of 1693 to 2100 and a goal of or 1900 and a goal of 2100 to 6078. After 6078, we set a goal of 7000. We know we're going to break it, and so it becomes that you focus on the stretch goal. So this past year, the goal was 11,000. We hit 12,658. Likely this coming year, our goal will be 13,000. Um, the donor part was the easy one. That was a no-brainer. What we started looking at for goals, you can't set a goal that's lower than what you did the year before, and you want to be cautious that you set a goal that's tough to reach. We've been able to really capitalize on stretch goals, and what I would say is if you're able to do that um, by by you know proving that you can capitalize on a stretch goal, set a goal that's easily achievable, and then put a lot of energy and, and planning into what the stretch goal would do. And so an example of that is our challenge milestones. We have our last milestone each year we solicit. We solicit it as, an, as under the guise of being in the wings. And so this past year was a $200,000 gift. I told the donors, we don't know what goal you're going to um, be unveiled at, but you're going to be positioned as in the wings when we reach our actual goal that a generous group of donors came forward to say, William & Mary can do more. And then that's where you really set a large stretch goal. So we went from 11000 to actually talking about a goal of 12 or 13,000 the minute we hit our actual goal. And so we're using that stretch goal to drive us. Um, if you're looking at what a successful number is to start out with, um, I would say our 1693 was planned based on the largest single day of giving we ever had, which was only about 800 donors, and it was our calendar year end. We looked at what our fiscal year and our June 30 day typically had been, which is usually about 600 donors. And so it was scalable. You know, if we had said 5,000 donors, we would have looked like rock stars because we would have hit it. But what we knew is that that was five times the amount of the single largest day of giving we had ever had. And so I would look at, if you've never done one before, look at your calendar year end, your fiscal year end, look for periods of great, of great activity. If you've done one in the past and you've blown through it, I would start taking a look at how you can leverage a stretch goal to get you a little bit higher. Great, excellent advice. Thanks so much. So I think that's um, all of our questions. Um, so thanks very much uh, to Dan for answering them. Um, and thank you to Dan for hosting our webinar today. Um, I think if the uh, attendees could give you a round of applause, I know that they would. <laughs> um, Dan's contact information will be um, in this uh, presentation um, just after this Q&A slide. Um, and Dan is happy for you to email him with uh, any questions that you may have after the fact. Um, we have a couple more resources available for you. So um, Hubbub uh, manages the Google Group crowdfund list, uh, not just for crowdfunding, but for anything digital giving related that you would like to ask the sector. Um, it's a great resource for you to throw your questions out there and get questions back from those who are giving, doing similar programs uh, in a digital giving space to you. Um, we also have the Hubbub Sharing Center, um, where we have a lot of resources from around the sector um, and our own resources about digital giving. So you can find crowdfunding um, manuals on there, um, templates for giving days, um, information about ambassadors, uh, and, and different uh, uh, resources in that area. <laughs> We do have um, one more web webinar scheduled um, before we break for the summer, um, and this will be um, our a webinar with Stanford, and it's called Hanging Up on the Telephone, the Silent Treatment to Advance the Conversation. Um, if you are a case member, you may have received your uh, case magazine or a digital copy where uh, Case interviewed Amy and Julianne uh, from the annual giving team at Stanford to ask them why they stopped their telephone campaign, a decision that rocked the sector. Um, and you can understand why they stopped their telephone campaign and how they turned um, to look at digital in a way to increase their relationship and their engagement with their donors. And that's on the 28th of June. Uh, finally, um, we will have a quick survey that will pop up once the webinar is done. Um, so please take the time to fill that out. Um, it will take you about three minutes. Um, so please do that. Uh, and just wanted to thank all of you for attending. Well, we really enjoy doing these webinars. We really enjoy having great speakers. Um, and we really enjoy having you along for the ride. So thank you very much for attending. Um, that's it from me. Dan, do you have anything else before we go? No, I would just say if you have questions, by all means, feel free to reach out to me. It's not a terribly large group, so I will do my best to answer everyone and, and continue a dialogue. Thank you all. Great. Thanks so much.